Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Mary O'Callaghan, and it's my privilege this evening to welcome you all here to the first and this wonderful lecture from the RCSI. As you know, like many of us, the RCSI, they're very much involved in enhancing human health. It's the core of their mission. They work in partnership with local, national, and patient communities, aim to leverage education, professional, and research expertise, as well as their physical location here and infrastructure to support and promote improved lifelong health and well-being. The RCSA My Health Programme, it's a suite of initiatives really that provides a trusted and accessible source of information on health and on well-being. The programme includes public lectures like this that cover health and well-being topics which are of broad interest to all of you including patients, your families and the wider public. The lectures are aimed at people who want to learn more about common illnesses and health-related topics, and who are interested in improving your personal health and well-being. So listen, you're all very welcome here. I know already from talking to some of the people who are on our panel tonight how fascinating this discussion is going to be, how interesting all our speakers are this evening, and I know how interested you are, all are as well. And after they speak, our first two keynote speakers, I will be throwing it to the floor so you'll all get an opportunity to ask questions, so don't worry about that. Our speakers, I'll tell you who they are now, and then I'll introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, first up will be Alex Berenson, known to many of you, I'm sure, who's written Tell Your Children the Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness and Violence. Second speaker this evening will be Professor Norman Delante, Future Neuro Research Centre here at the RCSI. Then joining us in the panel will be Professor Mary Cannon, who's Professor of Psychiatry here at the RCSI. Dr. Garrett McGovern also will be joining us on the panel. He's an addiction specialist at his own Priority Medical Clinic. And then finally, Professor Susan Smith, who's here also in the RCSI in the Department of General Practice, and she's also a working GP in a very busy practice in Inchicore. Okay, first up is Alex Berenson. Let me tell you a bit about him. Many of you will know he's also just flown in from the States this morning. Born in New York, grew up in Englewood, New Jersey. After graduating from Yale in 94 with degrees in history and economics, he joined the Denver Post as a reporter. In 96, he became one of the first employees at thestreet.com, which was, of course, the groundbreaking financial news website. In 99, he joined the New York Times. At the Times, he covered everything from the drug industry to Hurricane Katrina. In 2003 and 2004, he served two stints as a correspondent in Iraq, an experience that led him to write The Faithful Spy, his debut novel, which won the Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America for Best First Novel. He left the Times in 2010 to devote himself to writing fiction, but conversations with his wife led him to begin researching the science around cannabis and mental illness, a project that became the book Tell Your Children, which was, of course, published in January of this year. He's now written 12 John Wells novels, and two non-fiction books, The Number and Tell Your Children. He lives in Hudson Valley with his wife, who's also a doctor. Will you please give a very warm Irish welcome to Mr. Alex Berenson. Thank you so much for coming. And, uh, I hope, uh, I hope I'm graded on a curve a tiny bit since I did fly uh, in this morning. Uh, so Dr. Cannon, um, uh, this was more than a year ago, Shirley had no idea who I was, but when I, uh, I contacted her to ask her about a study that, uh, that is on one of the famous slides, uh, she was happy enough to talk about what she'd found, um, and, uh, and I'm very grateful to her. And so when she, uh, when she suggested that we, that we do this, um, I, I was very happy to agree. Um, but it, it, is, it is true that I would not have written Tell Your Children um, if not for another psychiatrist who, uh, who I know, um, my wife, Jacqueline, um, who was uh, until recently the director of forensics um, at a large uh, forensic psychiatric hospital in New York State. Um, and for those of you who don't know, a forensic psychiatric hospital is uh, where people who've been found not guilty by reason of insanity um, are sent uh, to, uh, technically they're patients, not inmates, and they're not serving out a sentence. They, um, they're there until they're judged no longer to be dangerous. Um, uh, but for all intents and purposes, um, 
unfortunately, these facilities are basically run as prisons, um, and uh, you know, and the people in them have committed terrible crimes. Um, uh, and um, and my wife, over you know, a multi-year period, really would tell me about how she'd seen uh, cases where cannabis seemed to be intricately linked uh, to the violence that uh, that 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 the the person had committed. And um, and I was quite skeptical about this, as I suspect many of you may be. Um, and uh, you know, she was the one who had uh, trained at uh, at Harvard and Columbia. She was the one who saw the patients. And I think she got tired of me mansplaining to her that this was couldn't possibly be true. <laughs> and she told me to go read the studies about cannabis and schizophrenia. And um, and frankly, I was shocked uh, at what I found. Um, and, uh, and so that was really where Tell Your Children, uh, the impetus for me to write the book came from, because I, I'd been a reporter at the New York Times for, uh, for 10 years, and I'd covered the drug industry, I'd covered the pharmaceutical industry, and some of the most important stories that I wrote at the paper um, in 2006 uh, were about a drug called Zyprexa, which is, uh, um, the generic name is Olanzapine, and uh, it's, you know, it's probably the most uh, widely, or one of the most widely used antipsychotic drugs in the world, and so I had some experience, um, you know, writing about uh, psychosis and, uh, and talking to psychiatrists about it. And I had no idea about this connection. And I thought to myself, okay, if I don't know about this, and, and, and in fact, if I believed that this couldn't possibly be true, there's, a, there's two stories here. One story is about the evidence, uh, you know, showing that cannabis is really a driver of severe mental illness. And the other is the story of how we don't know this. Um, and so uh, that, you know, that became uh, wh what drove me to, to write Tell Your Children. And in fact, the, the, the story of the evidence, the scientific evidence, is actually the, the easier story to tell because people say to me sometimes, well, you, you know, you're just a journal or you're, you're not a scientist, you're not an MD, both those things are true, you're just a journalist. And, you know, the, the truth is all I had to do was go look at some peer-reviewed papers that had been published in the very best scientific journals in the world and, you know, and look at this, um, you know, this report from 2017 from the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, which is really the leading independent public health advisory group in the United States. Um, and, you know, and, and its language is remarkably clear, and yet no one had paid any attention to it. So, so, th so there has been this campaign um, really for decades in the U.S., less so, uh, I think, in the U.K. and Ireland, but, uh, but, but it's coming here to exaggerate the benefits of cannabis um, and to underplay its harms. Uh, and first, I want to talk a little bit about the medical, uh, you know, the, the exaggeration of cannabis's medical benefits, because that's a crucial part of this story in the U.S., um, the way cannabis legalization has worked in almost every state is campaigners have pushed for medical marijuana. They've said, they've said, you know, literally in California in 1996 when all this started, it was this is for you know this is for women with breast cancer. This is for uh, you know men with HIV. This is for people dying of motor neuron disease. Um, you know, this, this is medicine and it's going to be good for them and you should approve it on that basis. It's medical marijuana. Um, and that has been sort of the original, uh, you know, not to, not to use biblical language, the original sin, the original lie of the legalization movement. And it's been incredibly successful because people don't want to deny other people medicine. Um, and they do, you know, they do want to help sick people. I, I mean, that's why all of you are, are here. Um, and so when you tell them that this is medicine, uh, you know, unless they bother to go look at the research themselves, and people aren't going to do that, they have lives and families and mortgages to pay, they're going to try to do the right thing or what they think is the right thing. But the truth is that there are almost no medical benefits to cannabis as shown in randomized controls trials. Um, and by, we're not, we're, I'm not talking about CBD. CBD is a non-psychoactive chemical in cannabis that does seem to have some medical benefits, and I think Norman will, will talk more extensively about those in his presentation. But CBD is not why most people who use cannabis use cannabis. People who use cannabis recreationally use it for THC. 
THC is the psychoactive, the primary psychoactive chemical in cannabis. It's the cannabis, it's the, it's the compound that gets you high. And in, in the last 20 years in the United States and Canada, there's been a big move towards very high THC, very low CBD versions of herbal cannabis. And in fact, increasingly people use pure THC or near pure THC extracts, which they smoke or, or take as edibles. So, so when people talk about the health benefits of cannabis, what they're usually talking about, to the extent that there's any scientific evidence, they're talking about CBD. But the fact is that most people who are using cannabis uh, recreationally are not using it for CBD because there's no CBD in it or almost no CBD in it. They're using it for THC. They're using it to get high. And in fact, one of the more interesting conversations I had in researching Tell Your Children was with um, the, the former head of something called the Marijuana Policy Project in the United States. And the MPP has been very successful at you know, getting cannabis legalization passed. And he said to me, you know, our own studies show that 94% of the people who get a medical marijuana authorization, because you can't get a prescription for medical marijuana, there's no FDA approved use for smokable cannabis, 94% um, of those people are recreational users. Uh, and, and that certainly uh, matches what what I've seen um, uh, and, on you know anecdotally, I would say. But 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 that was this was a person who was essentially acknowledging we used medicinal cannabis as a way to get recreational approval. So so how is it that we are so confused about this? Well, we're told cannabis is a you know is natural, um, but you know garlic is natural, you know, nightshade is natural. There's plenty of plants that have some medicinal value or certainly that contain chemicals that if it's purified can have some medicinal value. We don't pretend those plants are medicine anymore, not in Western countries. And alcohol can have some medicinal properties. Alcohol uh, can reduce your blood pressure and possibly lower your risk of CV events. And there's, you know, there's some evidence, I, I, I'm not an expert on the epidemiology of alcohol, there's some evidence that really moderate consumption of alcohol might reduce your overall mortality rate. I know that's in dispute. But we don't pretend alcohol is medicine. We know why we consume alcohol. We consume alcohol for intoxication, for, you know, to, to, to get drunk. I mean, unfortunately, that, that, ultimately, that's why a lot of people use. But even if they're not using it specifically to get, you know, to get drunk, drunk, they're using it to, to relax and to become intoxicated. And that's fine. That's, you know, alcohol is a, a legal substance practically everywhere in the world, but we don't pretend it's medicine. Um, so, and in fact, one, uh, uh, just, a, just last week I was at an event in Washington, D.C. with the, the head of a of a cannabis company, it was a, it was a, there were a number of people from all sides of the issue there, and uh, he said, "Yeah, yeah, we call it uh, the condition that cannabis treats is called not being high, and it treats it very effectively." Um, and you know, this, I mean, this was an off. This was he was he would never say that publicly, but the people who sell the drug know what the drug is used for. Um, so, so, so we've we've legalized cannabis in the U.S. on the basis, or, you know, piecemeal, but mainly on the basis that it's medicine. And there's one specific condition that I really want to talk about because it's also it's proven very effective uh, in the in the legalizer's arsenal, um, and uh, and it is really the only widespread condition for which there's all any but the most limited evidence that cannabis is effective, and that's cannabis for the treatment of pain. So, you know, cannabis is an intoxicant, and you would expect that it would have some uh, pain-killing qualities. Alcohol has some pain-killing qualities. Drugs that get you high generally uh, do have some pain-killing qualities. Um, and, and for a while, uh, there was a company called GW Pharma, which is a, a British company that is really the leading medicinal uh, cannabis company um, and is, is the manufacturer of Epidiolex, which is the purified CBD extract that is used to treat epilepsy. Um, so, so GW Pharma wanted to prove that cannabis could treat pain, um, can, THC, that THC extracts could treat pain. Um, and they ran a number of studies through 2014, through 2015, that, that seemed to show that cannabis worked moderately well as a pain reliever. The, 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 again, this is an extract. This is not smoked cannabis. This is 
This is a THC CBD extract that you take uh, as a spray. Um, uh, and so there was a lot of, um, I would say, excitement in the medical community about this because certainly in the US we have a terrible problem with prescription opioids. This would be a non-opioid uh, pain reliever. Um, and in 2015, there was a large paper written in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, that looked at its potential medicinal uses for cannabis. And again, the big one that, uh, where there's really any evidence at all was pain. And so, uh, you know, in the US, when cannabis has been legalized medicinally, pain is usually a condition for which you can get it. And when you legalize medicinally for pain, you're effectively opening the door to almost anyone who wants it because almost everybody has, you know, pain, of, you know, if you have an aching back or you have knee pain. Almost everyone in the modern world has pain at some point. And so it's, it's relatively easy to get an authorization by saying you have pain. The problem is that in the last couple of years, GW Pharma has done more studies on, on THC extracts for pain. And even against placebo, not against opioids, there is no separation. In other words, THC does not actually work as a pain reliever, which is kind of stunning considering that it is an intoxicant. And I don't think anybody's properly or fully explained why that might be. Um, my suspicion is that it, we're, we're, well, alcohol kind of dulls your sensations but enhances your emotions. THC is really the opposite. Uh, you know, you, the effects generally are that your, your, your sensations are enhanced but your emotions are dulled. And if you're in pain, you might not want your sensations to be enhanced. But for whatever reason, THC doesn't actually work as a pain reliever in the long term in clinical trials. And so, so I, would, I, I know there's an issue, there's a debate in Ireland around medicinal cannabis. If, if cannabis is going to be legalized for medicinal purposes, it should be legalized very narrowly and only for the conditions where there's really strong evidence that it works, which are almost no conditions and certainly not pain. Um, and, the, and the other point, the other reason that I dwell on this issue is that the United States, as I'm sure you have all are aware, uh, and Canada, have terrible problems with opioid overdoses. We have a terrible opioid overdose epidemic in the United States. Um, something like half a million people have died since 2000 um, from, from the opioid crisis. And it's, it's, the problem is not going away. Uh, I believe in 2018, almost 70,000 people died from overdoses in general in the US, and close to 50,000 of those were opioid overdoses. It's, it's really. I was, I was talking to a, a public health expert about this, and he said the only, the only public health um, poisoning crisis that he could think of that was at all comparable to this was post-Soviet. Uh, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was an incredible increase in alcoholism. Um, but even that only lasted a few years. This is really unprecedented. So the cannabis community has tried to say, if you legalize cannabis, you will reduce the risk of people dying from opioid deaths. And they've pointed to some very, very poorly designed studies uh, that basically draw on state level data in the US uh, to claim this is true. Um, it is not true. First of all, uh, research that I did actually with, a, with an NYU professor um, and that was later backed up by a, a couple of psychiatrists um, at Stanford shows that even if you look at state level data, if you look at the most recent data, there's no association between legalizing medicinal cannabis and opioid death uh, rates. In other words, you can't, you can't make any conclusions. But more importantly, cannabis doesn't treat pain properly, so it can't really be an off-ramp for people who are using opioids who need them for pain, which is, a, you know, which is a subset of people who are using opioids. And cannabis, uh, when you actually look at individuals, and this is a much better way to look at uh, data than to try to draw, draw conclusions from state level data. If you look at individuals, there's a very good study that came out of Australia last year, and there's a good study that came out. It's, the data is relatively old, although the study is relatively new. And both, and that, that's from US data, both of those studies show that individuals who use cannabis are much more likely to have problems with opioids uh, in later years than people who don't use cannabis. Cannabis is, is a gateway drug, and we can argue about why it's a gateway drug, whether it's a gateway drug because you go to your dealer 
and he's also got cocaine or heroin, and so maybe you wind up trying those things later. Maybe it's a gateway drug pharmacologically. It primes your brain for more addiction. Maybe it's a gateway drug culturally. You're used to getting high, and your friends get high, and one day you decide to try something new. But the evidence is overwhelming that use of cannabis is a major risk factor for use of other drugs later. So, so and, and, I, and I know that actually Ireland doesn't have a huge problem with, uh, with heroin right now or opioids, unlike the US. And your rates of cannabis are significant use are significantly lower than our rates. And that's true in Canada too. This is not about healthcare system models. This is about whether or not you have a society where cannabis use is widely accepted and what the downstream effects of that may be. Um, so, so I wanted to talk about those two issues, the, the idea that cannabis, uh, cannabis's medicinal benefits have been widely overstated, and the issue of cannabis specifically for pain and as a potential solution to the opioid crisis, and um, before I move on to the issue of cannabis and mental health. Um, and I know that uh, we are, I don't want to take too much time because we had the issue with the slides, but um, so let's talk about cannabis and, and severe mental illness. Um, now, so this, the first big study on this is more than 30 years old. Uh, and um, it, you know, it was published in The Lancet, uh, which is you know, one of the three or four best peer-reviewed medical journals in the world. Um, and it showed clearly that if you used cannabis, these, are, these, are, these numbers are not adjusted for other risk factors, um, but it showed clearly that if you used cannabis, you appeared to have a much higher risk of developing schizophrenia later. Um, Sweden has very good data uh, on mental health, unlike the US uh, or, you know, or Canada, for example, but, but, but the Swedish national registers on schizophrenia are quite good. And uh, this Dr. Sven Andreessen was able to look at some data involving conscripts to the Swedish army in 1969 and see who later developed schizophrenia. And again, he found that if you had used more than 50 times, your risk ratio was about six times as high as somebody who'd never used the drug. So, so, so this was the first study. And this, as I say in the book, uh, as I say and tell your children, did not answer the question of whether or not cannabis causes schizophrenia. It merely showed a link. So what's been going on for the last 30 years? For the last 30 years, scientists like Dr. Cannon, um, really from all over the world, but especially, uh, you know, this has been led in the UK and Europe, not in the US, have looked at every possible way to try to see if this link is real and to try to see whether it's confounded. And over and over again, people say to me, I've lost track of the number of times that people said to me on Twitter, correlation is not causation, as if, as if they are telling me something that I didn't know. As if, <laughs> um, um, so, so what does that mean, that correlation is not causation? Well, the classic example of this is, um, you know, in a neighborhood where there's a lot of crime, you might see a lot of police. Police don't cause crime, they're responding to crime. But you might think if you, you know, well, there's a lot of police, there's a lot of crime, therefore police cause crime. Obviously not true. Correlation is not causation. What that actually means though is that correlation doesn't prove causation. It doesn't mean that correlation is the opposite of causation. It means that correlation is something that we can look at when we're trying to determine causation. And as a scientist, as a, as a doctor, and I know a lot of you are doctors or are going to be doctors, what you really want is a randomized controlled trial. You really want a big study that looks at, you know, hopefully thousands of people split into two equal groups who are one of, one group is given a treatment and one group is not, and then you see what happens to them later. You're gonna be told, or you know, probably you already all know this, that statins are a good treatment for heart disease, uh, and statins reduce the risk of heart attacks. Why can we say that with such certainty? Because there's been dozens of clinical trials with hundreds of thousands of people, and they show clearly that the people get, getting the statins have a much lower incidence of heart attacks than those who don't. And that's why statins are so widely prescribed and so confidently prescribed. Unfortunately, we can't do that with cannabis and schizophrenia or cannabis and any illness. It's not ethical to give people a drug to see if it might hurt them. This is a core principle of medical and scientific research. It should be. 
and it would be totally impractical anyway. What are you going to do? T you know, give 5,000 teenagers, uh, you know, two joints a day and make them smoke for the next three? I mean, it's impossible. So we don't have randomized controlled trials, and we never, ever will. In the, in the absence, by the way, we never have had a randomized controlled trial that shows that smoking causes lung cancer. But we all know that smoking causes lung cancer. The epidemiological and scientific evidence is overwhelming. So, so for the last 30 years, and, and, and another thing you should you know, be aware of is that for a long time, the cigarette companies said that correlation was not causation with lung cancer. They suggested that, that there might be you know, some genetic, uh, hidden genetic uh, issue that led people both to smoke and develop lung cancer. They suggested that people smoked because uh, they were getting sick with lung cancer. They suggested lots of things that, that have proven to be ridiculous nonsense. And ultimately, I think that's where we'll get with cannabis and severe mental illness. Arguably, we are not quite there yet, but we are getting close. So for the last 30 years, people have tried to tease out correlation and causation. How do you do that? You look at whether or not there's a dose-response ratio. Do people who smoke more tend to have a higher risk? You can clearly see that here, and you see it in all the, uh, practically all the epidemiological evidence. You look at what's called challenging and de-challenging people. So if people have severe mental illness and their symptoms are controlled and they're not using, what happens when they start using again? And it turns out a lot of them get really sick really fast. Um, you can look at analogs to cannabis, synthetic cannabinoids, which affect the same brain receptor that cannabis and THC does, but more powerfully. And those drugs can cause psychosis very quickly, even in people who have no pre-existing symptoms of mental illness. You can look at, um, and this is really, this was Dr. Cannon's uh, contribution to the research, um, and an amazing paper from 2002 um, which looked at people who had prodromal symptoms when they were age 11. So, so, so this, was from a, this is from a cohort of, uh, of people in, in New Zealand on the South Island, about 1,000 kids who are still being studied today. The study began almost 50 years ago. And one of the amazing things about the, pay, uh, the study was that when these, when these children at the time were 11, a psychiatrist, I believe it was, it was a psychologist or a psychiatrist, asked them questions to see if they had symptoms of psychosis. And, and so the researchers were able to look at those people and say, even accounting for people who were not diagnosed with schizophrenia but did have symptoms of psychosis, did cannabis use result in an increased risk of schizophrenia or schizophrenia-like illnesses, and they found that they did. This is an, this is an amazing bit of work. Um, we can look at, we can try to see whether people who have a genetic load, since we know schizophrenia and severe mental illness have genetic components to them, do those people have a greater risk if they use? And it turns out, yes, they do, but people who don't have a genetic load also have a greater risk. So if you, if you are somebody with severe mental illness in your family, you really shouldn't use cannabis and THC. But even if you're not, if you use enough, it can damage you severely. So, and there's even a study now, uh, there's, a, there's a very large ongoing study in the US called the ABCD study, um, which is funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health. And there's some early data from that showing that the children of mothers who used cannabis in pregnancy after they knew they were pregnant are demonstrating higher rates of psychotic symptoms at age 11. Okay, this is before they use. So this is showing that cannabis, which we know can cross the placental barrier, the THC, can affect brain development even in fetuses. At least that's what the evidence suggests. So we have all these different ways that we can say there's a link between cannabis and severe mental illness, and it's not explained in reverse. It's not reverse causation. It's not, you're not smoking because you got sick. You may, after you're sick, temporarily you know, find relief from your symptoms, just as you would with other drugs. But, but on the way in, it is, it is the smoking temporarily before the sickness. And so, so at this point, I mean, if you'd say to me, OK, tobacco and lung cancer, we're 100% there. Where are we with, with uh, cannabis and schizophrenia? Where are we with cannabis and severe mental illness? We're not at 100%. There's still questions we need to answer. Um, 
and, uh, and there's still issues about how severe the risk is. Are you increasing your risk by 2x? Are you increasing it by 5x? What does it mean if you start smoking at 12 versus 18? What does it mean if you, you know, if you have a few joints? Probably, probably not that much, just as if you have just a few cigarettes when you're in your teens, you don't change your lung cancer risk that much. But when you, so, so there are questions that we need to answer about the risk ratios and the absolute risk level here. But to my mind, this is certainly a severe enough risk that we should be talking about it in the context of legalization. We should be talking about it in the context of discouraging use. In, you're very lucky in Ireland. You haven't gone nearly as far down this road as we have in the United States. The community of users is smaller. It's much less powerful. There's not an industry that's pushing for legalization. You have a chance to listen to the science instead of listening to propaganda. And this is what the science says. And I will just present, this is, this is an even more recent, this is from this, is from this year, uh, this is uh, from King's College London, uh, Dr. Marta DeForti, who's also quoted in the book. Um, you know, again, daily use of cannabis is a 5x increase. And this, this is what Dr. DeForti called high potency cannabis, meaning it had more than 10% THC, but by US standards, that's that's not high potency at all. Um, uh, as I said, people are smoking much stronger cannabis now than they used to, and that's especially true in the US and Canada. People, th there's a community of users that wants to use very strong THC, uh, or very strong THC products, and a lot of THC. And, uh, and, and, and that's who we in the US and, and the Canadian government are catering to. And you don't have to do that. You can, you can try to discourage use here, and, uh, and I really recommend that you do. And there's these, so, so this is what the leading scientific authorities in the US are saying. And the language is clear. Um, again, this does not mean, by the way, that we need to throw you know, millions of people in prison for cannabis use in Ireland or the US or anywhere else. There's a, there's a perfectly reasonable argument to make you know, for decriminalization, for trying to get people help and discourage use. But why we would want to legalize this drug, I don't know. And why we would pretend that it's medicine, I don't know. Um, and the last two slides I'm not gonna go through because first of all, there's a lot on them, but, but there, there is evidence increasingly that what we know that psychosis and psychotic illnesses are strongly linked to severe violence. This goes, this is sort of to, goes all the way back around, completes the circle with what my wife saw at the Mid-Hudson Forensic Psychiatric Institute. Um, for, for 50 years, we've been told that cannabis doesn't cause mental illness and that any discussion of cannabis linked to, uh, cannabis is linked to violence is just silly. Um, you, you will get mocked by people for saying it. And, I, and, I, and I've heard um, that you know, when focus groups are done, I've never actually seen one of these, but that when you do focus groups with young people on this issue, they literally will start to laugh about it. That's how deep the, uh, the, sort of the, the propaganda from the industry and from the legalization community has run about this. That, that I, I have, you know, there's, there's 16 studies on these two slides. They're all peer reviewed. They all show a link between cannabis and psychosis, uh, between cannabis psychosis and violence, or cannabis and violence. There, and and there are other studies too that 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 I couldn't even didn't even have space for. Um, this is a real issue. Uh, it's in some ways I don't even like talking about it because I, it's hard enough to, to convince people about cannabis and psychosis, but it is a real <laughs> downstream issue. And in the U.S., we're seeing public safety problems in the states that have legalized. Whether or not those will continue to worsen, I don't know, but it's another good reason to proceed very cautiously on legalization. So um, that's the book. Uh, I, I think there's like three copies in, in Ireland right now, which is a great job by Simon and Schuster, but um, you, can, you can order it online, um, and, uh, and I hope you will. But thank you all, and uh, I will sit down and listen to Norman. That was so interesting, Alex. Thanks so much. And I know there's different views. And don't worry, later on, we will get balance. And if anyone else, you know, wants to quiz and question Alex, there'll be plenty of time for that. 
Next up is Professor Norman Delante. He is a consultant neurologist here in Dublin at Bowman Hospital. He's also director of the hospital's epilepsy program and associate professor here at RCSI. He's also a principal investigator at the SFI-funded Future Neuro Research Centre, which is hosted by RCSI. And he's going to talk this evening to us. The title of his talk is Approved Indications for Medical Cannabinoids in Ireland. Thanks so much, Norman. Thank, thank you, Miriam. Uh, thanks, Professor Cannon, for inviting me to speak. Uh, welcome, everybody here, um, and welcome to our uh, beautiful new building, or relatively new building here at RCSI, uh, to discuss this rather complex and sometimes uh, emotive uh, issue. Um, so um, I'm a, a physician, as you heard, and I'm going to try and come at this uh, from a, a, obviously, from a, a, a medical perspective. Um, hopefully the slides won't decide to... Uh, okay, so uh, this is cannabis. Uh, that's the, uh, the um, Latin name of the plant. Uh, obviously there's a variety of uh, names uh, for this uh, plant. Um, the important thing to, I suppose, one of the important things to, to realize is that um, the, the cannabis plant contains many different chemical compounds, um, at least a hundred, and it would maybe vary from from the, the different types of plants that are bred. So this is this is a complex uh, plant that contains many many compounds. Uh, it has to be said that it is an illegal drug in Ireland, and uh, we hear a lot about the two main medical constituents. And Alex has obviously mentioned these already. Um, are two potential medical cannabinoids, um, THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, which is psychoactive, and then cannabidiol, CBD, which is not psychoactive. Cannabidiol does not induce a high um, that is uh, used by most people who obviously use the cannabis plant uh, recreationally or so-called recreationally. Um, it's also important to uh, realize the cannabidiol. There's a lots of talk about CBD. You can't walk down... Uh, practically your local high street now and you'll come across some shop or health food, uh, health food shop selling a variety of CBD products. So CBD is not a medicine in Ireland. CBD, its legal status in Ireland is that it's a food supplement, okay? Very little regulation as to what gets into your local, uh, local um, uh, health food shop in terms of the, the manufacturing process and the actual quality and amount of CBD in the product that you, you might buy. And the other thing that probably should be said about, about this whole area is that these products, uh, including the health food products, are expensive. Okay, they, these are expensive and we'll, we'll, maybe we'll probably talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go through these slides. These were slides that were uh, give, given to me just to, to make a, few, a number of points, but uh, given to me by uh, my colleague, Professor Oren Davinsky, who's a very world-renowned epileptologist at New York University. The point here being that um, a medical cannabis, or I shouldn't say medical, well, cannabis in general has been used by Homo sapiens back to antiquity, back to China, Asia, um, and right throughout the Middle East uh, in antiquity. And if we bring it up a little bit more, um, it's interesting to note that the father of modern medical cannabis, I'm not sure if, uh, I'm sure, sure Alex does know this, is actually an Irish physician who was alive and practicing in the first half of the 19th century. He did a lot of work apparently in India and he got interested in medical cannabis. He is originally from Limerick. He studied in Trinity and he got his medical degree at, out of Edinburgh. And when he, when he did his, came back from India, he I think was, it, it, I, I haven't read a lot about him, but he, he sort of brought back the modern concept of potentially ma medical cannabinoids, cannabinoids to the so-called uh, West. And of course then in the last 10, 20 years ago, the biochemistry of the cannabis plant has been studied in many laboratories around the world and it continues to be studied, including our own laboratories here um, at um, uh, Future Nora here in RCSI. Tom Hill is in the audience. He's an expert in um, the chemistry of uh, uh, some medical cannabinoids. He might, he might thank me for pointing him out. Uh, okay, so this is also an important uh, thing to, to mention, and I, I do feel strongly about this, and Alex mentioned it. It can be described as the naturalistic uh, fallacy. So people, 
you, me, any, or, or relatives, people out there often think that if a drug is derived from a natural plant, then it's better, it's safer, and it's a more holistic medication or substance to use. Uh, again, as Alex pointed out, many drugs used in medicine are already derived, and many potent drugs, including some drugs used for cancer, for example, Taxol, are derived from uh, natural plants. And we also know that many natural chemicals in plants um, and fungi, for example, are harmful or potentially lethal. And I would point out that a chemical entity is a chemical entity. We're living in one universe, and all our, our chemistry uh, has to obey the laws of chemistry and physics on this planet that we're living in. So, you know, we shouldn't get into this dichotomy as to, oh, this is natural, it has to be better, or it, it, it is what it is. Okay, so the other thing to point out, and uh, again, I don't, I'm, I don't mean to be negative, I, I'm trying to, you know, but we do need to point out some of the issues that are, impor that are important. Uh, with with, with, with uh, all due respect to our, our chair, the media will generally only report on positive studies. So if you pick up the paper and you read that somebody has had a dramatic response to a, a medical cannabinoid, then that's a good story. But all the other stories that people tried medical cannabinoids, they went down to the hemp store and they, uh, on, on Capel Street and they bought CBD and they tried CBD and it hasn't worked. Now your local friendly reporter from the Evening Herald isn't going to write a story about that. Okay, so there's clear pu publication bias. Um, patients will react to drugs in different ways. This is true for all different drugs, not just uh, cannabidiol. And the other thing is that many patients with epilepsy and severe epilepsy will have no therapeutic response to uh, CBD therapy. So it's not a cure, a, a cure all that might sometimes come across in some of the dramatic uh, and, and, and uh, the, the stories are, 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 are fine in their own right and they tell good stories, but it's not, sometimes the, the, the story is, is angled at, in such a way that this is for everybody, it's not. Um, I, I'm conscious of time, so I, I, I'm from Cork, so I can speak a little bit quickly. So um, <laughs> the other thing to realize is that getting a medicine to market as a, uh, as a medication that the doctor can prescribe is a highly complex and expensive process. So if, if a drug is, is developed and goes into, in these days, clinical trials, the, 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 the top order one would be a randomized controlled clinical trial. This is a highly uh, expensive process, but if, if usually a company, a pharmaceutical company, gets to a stage where they've done a number of trials that they think shows a benefit, then this then has to go through step, two, two steps before uh, the drug can get to a pharmacy next to your pharmacy next door. So it has to be approved by regulatory authorities who look at the evidence for this drug for a particular indication. And then the, the, the next thing is that whatever health system you're working in or whatever health system you're, you're as a doctor, you're, you're prescribing, this has to be approved for reimbursement. And these are two separate but actually highly complex issues. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I won't go through this, but the two main uh, regulatory authorities that approve medicines, not food supplements, medicines, are the Food and Drugs Administration in the States and um, the European Medicines Agency within the European Union. So they, they have, and, and this is relevant, so if you take Epidiolox, which is the oil, the CBD oil that's produced by GW Pharma in London, um, this GD, uh, Epidiolox is now approved for use in particular indications in epilepsy in the United States, but it's still waiting approval by the European American Medicines Agency. We can discuss why that is. Again, just to move on. And then when a drug is approved, for example, in this country by the European Medicines Agency, the HSE Medicines Management Program, who's directed by Michael Barry, who's based in St. James's Hospital, will then have to decide, well, we have this drug, can we now approve it so that the state pays for it, or by and large pays for it? Uh, and and in, a, in a situation where can cannabinoids are expensive, this is highly relevant. Now the whole area of precision therapeutics and gene therapy is gonna make this a huge issue for society in terms of how we pay for expensive drugs. Some of you may be aware of the whole story about spinal muscular atrophy in infants and two new gene therapies that have been approved uh, by the FDA, but these are hugely expensive, but they're, 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 they're compounds are, are treatments that can treat a fatal illness in, 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 in infants. So there's lots of uh, discussions here to be had in, in society over the coming years about precision therapeutics and expensive drugs. Um, this is the Medical Cannabis Access Program, which was announced by Simon Harris in June of this year. Um, 
they are currently be in, in discussions with a number of suppliers of what we might call pharmaceutical uh, grade uh, CBD. Um, and once suitable medical cannabis products are available, and I highlight that they're in bold, then the access program will begin. And the three indications are spastic spasticity or intractable spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, intractable nausea and vomiting associated with the use of chemotherapy, and severe refractory uh, or treatment resistant epilepsy. So, but this, this access program has not begun yet because suitable medical cannabis products are not available in this country and haven't been approved by the HPRA, um, which is obviously on behalf, of, uh, on behalf of the state and on behalf of the taxpayer. So very briefly, um, CBD has shown to be effective in two areas really associated with uh, pediatric epilepsy, severe epilepsy in children. One, and these are on the basis of randomized controlled trials that have been published in uh, uh, top-class uh, peer-reviewed journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so one is a condition called Drave syndrome. This is, a, this is a really severe epilepsy that begins in infancy, and it's associated with multiple different seizures. It's very intractable, like, associated later on with learning disability. Um, so, and it's related 80% of the time to a specific, or to a mutation in a specific gene uh, that the term uh, called the sodium, ch uh, sodium channel, it's a bit complicated, but it's a gene called SCN1A that's important in sodium channel regulation and the action potential in, in the nervous system. So that's one. And the other one then is, is, is slightly similar, lennox gastaut syndrome, which is more a diffuse group of severe childhood epilepsies with a number of different causes, some of which we don't understand, some are, ge some of are, are genetic and other uh, rare mutations in other genes, and that's been shown to uh, help what, what we call drop seizures. There is no formal clinical studies that show that CBD is effective in any other type of epilepsy. Okay, so th there, 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 there are some studies ongoing. Um, okay, CBD dosing, I'm not gonna talk about that unless somebody has any questions. Um, the other, the la last slide or second last slide. So, going back to the naturalistic fallacy, these, these have these, and, and I'm not talking about whole psychiatric issues. Obviously, that that Alex has been discussing primarily re related to THC. But even if you look at cannabidiol, they do have side effects because it's a it's a chemical compound you're putting into your body. So it includes diarrhea. Uh, anorexia, somnolence, it can alter your liver function tests if you're on, particularly if you're on another medication called epilim. It can interact with other drugs, make it, uh, it increasing the levels of the drug, particularly a drug called frisium. Um, and also, uh, there's no available data on the safety of, of, the, of this uh, uh, substance in pregnancy, and the safety of long-term use is not known either. So, to, f to finish, this is an exciting time for medical research into, uh, into medical cannabinoids, but we shouldn't leave the excitement and potentially the hype get in the way of good clinical science. Um, there are significant challenges, apparently, apparently at the moment, interesting enough, around a good quality pharmaceutical grade cannabis supply worldwide. Uh, and that's partly the reason that this, the, the even pharmaceutical grade cannabis is, is, is expensive and potentially getting more expensive. We don't have a suitable medical cannabis product in Ireland to initiate the access program that was announced by the minister. And there are significant issues from a, from a neurology or physician point of view about who, who, who are the right patients you select for, uh, uh, and for treatment and for reimbursement. And these are societal issues. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm done. Norman, you stay up there. And Alex, if you come back as well. And I'm going to introduce you now to our other three panellists. Uh, first up, uh, she was obviously cited by Alex, Professor Mary Cannon, RCSI Professor of Psychiatry. Here, she's a psychiatrist and a research scientist. She's received the Royal Academy of Medicine in Ireland's Doctor's Award for Psychiatry. She's among the most highly cited scientists in the world. Um, her research program centers on investigating early life risk factors for later adult psychiatric disorders. She's collaborated in the UK, the US and Finland, and she's published in many high-ranking psychiatric journals. Second, could we bring up Dr. Garrett McGovern? He's an addiction specialist in the Priority Medical Clinic. He's a founder of it as well. Um, he qualified in medicine in 95 from Trinity and specialized in the treatment of addictive disorders since the implementation of the methadone treatment protocol in 98. He's also one of the first members of the International Doctors for Healthy Drug Policies, an international group of medical addiction experts aiming to promote sensible drug policies. And finally, Professor Susan Smith here, the Department of General Practice at RCSI, Susan is part of. 
She's also a GP in Inchicore in a very big practice called Inchicore Family Doctors. She completed vocational training in general practice in the UK and she has undertaken clinical work in general practice since that within the UK, Australia and Ireland. So let's give them all a round of applause. Okay, listen, Mary, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask a few questions and then I'll throw it to the floor. You know what I often think? You know, I've got a lot of young adolescent adults myself. Young people think they're invincible, don't they? So how do you get across to, say, a young guy who's in college of 19 that cannabis can be dangerous for them? Like, how do you do that? So, the, the, and, and you're right, young people do feel they're invincible. They have no yeah. concept of, of death or, or illness. And, and that's why I suppose... It all, Cannabis is a, is, a, is a drug of youth. Tobacco, smoking starts in youth. High alcohol uh, starts in youth. You, you can't tell people about the, the risks. They, they, they just won't listen. So we have to find another way of doing it. And I suppose that's, we haven't put enough effort into that. You know, we're mm. talking a lot about, about legalising drugs, but we have to get to the roots of why people are using this and why people are becoming dependent and you know, the social determinants. Um, just the, the, the one place in the world I think we should be looking at is Iceland because they have managed to reduce from uh, down to 2% uh, cannabis use in their young people. So what has Iceland been doing that the rest of us haven't been doing? They have focused on you know, getting young people, every family is given a voucher for activities for their child, 200 euros a year the equivalent. They, they've set up their sports groups, music groups, get the young people active, and they just, they're not using the drugs. They're, Really interesting, Mary. And I suppose Garrett and Susan, from your point of view, that key question before I throw it to the floor, how do you convince young adults to keep away from it? And do you believe we should, Gareth, actually? more well, well, I don't think we should give up on education, but I think uh, we, every piece of research I've read regarding, other than perhaps Iceland, um, has shown that we've completely failed. So going around to schools and telling people the perils of drug use doesn't work. So I think we cannot lose sight of education, but we have to change the way in which we impart that message. And I'm, I'm afraid there's an uncomfortable truth here, and that is that young people will take drugs. Um, we have this view that we need to be completely intolerant of that, and that will make them not take drugs. So that just has not worked. So we need to change the way we're talking to young people. But how do, like what? What do we do? Well, I mean, we're, 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 cha we're changing in Ireland anyway. I mean, we're looking at, you know, you know, as an example, people going to festivals and being able to declare mm. that they have drugs and, and looking at the possibility of testing drugs. So in other words, we're moving down certainly a harm reduction route, which has worked very, very well in terms of heroin addiction in this country. And I think we need to maybe look at that and um, absolutely not lose sight of the fact that why do people take drugs in the first place? But the reality is they do take drugs. And I, don't, I haven't seen anybody have an answer as to how you stop people taking drugs and engage in activities that are, are, are healthy for them. Some youngsters will always do it. There's some youngsters will never touch drugs, and, and, but many of them will. And you know, this country, sad to say, is awash with drugs, recreational drugs. There's no question about it. So, so yeah. I, I don't understand how anybody can look at the history of tobacco use in the West in the last 50 years and not say that societies can't influence drug use. Uh, Tobacco is an incredibly addictive substance, uh, and we've driven down its use in the U.S. and Europe to uh, extremely low levels in the last 50, in the last really 30 years. We've stigmatized its use. Uh, you know, for a long time, Hollywood basically wouldn't show anybody smoking. Um, we've we've spent billions and billions of dollars in the United States on, you know, showing people with scars in their chests and smoking through holes in their lungs, and it turns out that actually. 19-year-olds don't want to have holes. I'm sorry, holes in their throats. Uh, mm. They don't want to. They don't want to see, um, uh, you know, a 40-year-old woman with half her jaw cut off. It turns out that you actually can discourage drug use, and um, the discouraging of tobacco use uh, in the West has been an enormous public health victory. And yet, it's just completely ignored by people who say that there's some core level of drug use that we can't touch. Yeah. But Alex, I think my, my feeling is the key element in driving down tobacco use, at least in this country, has been legislation. Right. Has been the, 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 the public smoking, you know, pu smoking in public places act. Do you, I think that was more effective than the pictures of people. With, <coughs> but it's all, their... it's, it's all been of a piece, right? We, yeah. Society has said we're going to discourage this, we're going to spend money discouraging this, we're going to, we're going to tell people about the consequences in a real way. And by the way, we don't say if you smoke a pack a day for 40 years, you have a 1% chance of getting lung cancer before the age of 60, which is true. 
we say tobacco causes lung cancer, because that's also true. So you can present the message in a way that is true and effective, and that's what we've done with tobacco. Um, you know, we've made, we've made drinking in pregnancy much less acceptable in the U.S. That's been another public health victory. Uh, again, I just think the idea that, that the, you know, the people in the drug reform community, as they like to call it, say that there's just some fixed level of drug use and we can't do anything but manage it is, is completely uh, not worn out by the facts. And I will, first of all, I'm just conscious, Susan, I want you yeah, to bring... Well, like, you're at the cold face a lot. You're well, a GP. And, and, and 18% of people in Ireland are still smoking tobacco. I mean, right. you know, so we haven't beaten tobacco, right. despite overwhelming evidence that it's harmful for your health. Um, I think it's, this is a really complex issue. There will not be one single answer. It's going to be a mixture of education, positive messaging. I would suspect that most 18-year-olds would stop smoking if there was something about giving them bad breath rather than they're going to get lung cancer when they're 70. You know, it's that, and it is all these influencers on social media. They're, they're very powerful pathways. Um, and I suspect we just don't really know is the truth, but we, de we definitely need to find it out because we have a problem. And, and we need to try and address it. And are you seeing the kind of, like, really interesting talks I thought we yeah. heard from both Alex and Norman? Are you seeing in your practice, you know, either on a regular basis or at least now and then, young people presenting with psychosis are coming in and you think you really shouldn't be smoking dope? By the time they have psychosis from smoking mm. cannabis or from other... I mean, it's way too late for that. It's, mm. it's the truth. Uh, you know, what you need to be doing... And actually, GPs probably don't see as many of these people because, you know, yeah. teenagers don't come to their GP that much. But we are part of the messaging for parents. I mean, it is interesting in Ireland. I think there's a lot of parents who think that cannabis is kind of okay. I smoked a bit of it when I was in college. You know, it's not that harmless, like alcohol's legal. What's the problem? In fact, they just don't realize that what people are smoking now is much, much more potent than what they might have smoked when they were in college. And really, it is this dose response that Alex talked about. Maybe it's okay to smoke a joint once a month or once every two or three months, but if you were using it daily, you know, it's not just about psychosis, it's also about the fact that you're, you're sleepy, you can't drive, you're confused, you're dizzy. It causes adverse effects that, are, that people take thinking, I'm feeling a bit edgy and anxious, so I'll smoke another joint. But the joints are making them feel that way. So, but people don't know that, so it's really about information for the parents as well as for the kids. And, you know, I suppose if cannabis, though, Mary, is so pervasive, so bad for our mental health, we're not seeing an epidemic of psychosis. Now, I'm being a devil's advocate here. Is that not correct? So why aren't we? Well, it, uh, as, as Susan said, it, psychosis will really only crop up acute psychosis in the emergency departments and in the inpatient psychiatry units. So you won't, GPs won't see it, neurologists won't see it. Most people don't see it, but we're seeing it. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I'm seeing increasing numbers of cannabis-induced psychosis it, at the moment. It, it's quite, you know, even for me, and I know the link, mm. I'm thinking, what is going on here? And, you know, rates of schizophrenia, which is the, there's a difference between cannabis-induced psychosis and schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is more chronic. Mm. But, you know, if you have a cannabis-induced psychosis, you have a 40% chance of going on to develop schizophrenia, which is a, a very chronic illness. So it, 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 rates of schizophrenia are on the increase in many countries around the world. But it's, it's a relatively rare condition still, and it's hard to pick up that you know, from, and in Ireland, we, our registers are not great, but we're definitely seeing more um, admissions for cannabis-related illness. In fact, uh, Bobby Smith, who's, who's here in the audience, he, he did this calculation, and it, it even started with me. You're more likely in Ireland, at the, between 20, 2015 and 2017, to be admitted to hospital for a medical, for, for a cannabis-related illness than to be arrested for possession of a drug. Wow. Or convicted, sorry, convicted for, yeah. yeah. It's not, it just puts it in perspective. Yeah. But as Susan mentioned, I'm conscious that these are great public lectures about my health. For any parent who's worried, what are the key signs you should look out for, you know, that your son or daughter may be using cannabis? Well, it, so in the U.S. now, there's so much use of, um, of edibles and this high THC stuff that you, it's actually, you can't really smell any of this. Um, and so it's more behavioral issues. And... Look, if you have, for I have, I have kids. I don't. Fortunately, they're not teenagers yet. I, I, I suspect there will be some people who try to get them high. Um, uh, but uh, you know, so so obviously, you know, teenagers can have, they can behave in ways you don't like. Their behavior can change from month to month. So it's a, so it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's you don't want to overreact to everything. But 
if, if your child is, you know, displays marked behavioral changes and also just, you know, sort of sitting, sitting in his room all day and, and won't come out and wasn't like that six months ago and, uh, you know, his grades are going down, his, his memory is going down, you know, his memory seems mm -hmm. to not be there. there. There are things you can pick up before they get to the, the I'm hearing voices stage. Yeah. I, I think it's very difficult, that, that, but I think I've always been, as, as a, a parent of 23 and 20 year olds, I've always been a great believer when they were younger teenagers to bring their friends in, have them over, meet mm -hmm. all their friends. Yeah, that was, that's yeah. a safety net. Yeah. I'll just speak as a parent. Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I, I agree to that. In fact, one of the main um, reasons I, I've become very interested in counselling is, is just talking to my son, and he was saying, I, I was uh, at the kitchen table, like you know, with your wife, you know, you're going on about cannabis, and he said, Mom, you know, no one knows about this. My friends all think this is this this stuff is okay, you know. And I, he said you have to start telling people this, and that that's why you know because doctors don't we don't like appearing out in public very much. We're a bit kind of shy and retiring, <laughs> and uh, so you know I just felt okay. We have to do this. But it just just one last thing. It's just yeah. the other important. I know we're talking a lot about psychosis, but we have to also talk about the um, the, the 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 effects of cannabis on just brain function. So you know, as, as my memory, concentration, ability to learn. If there's increased rates of school dropout. These are actually probably the most uh, more worry, you know, because it's not as, not rare. It's quite a common. Area. I mean, it, it, it is funny to me that you know after the book came out, I was contacted by a you know, very pro legalization uh, scientist. And he said, he said, you know, you're talking about this, and this, you know, this might affect one percent or two percent of users. And by the way, even if it's one or two percent, given the, 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 the costs. Of psychosis and the and the and the harms to families and to users and to society, I think it's worth discussing in detail. But but yes, it's clearly not as common as you know uh, issues around motivation and memory and, and success in school. But but I said to him, I said, you know, is this a reason to legalize that that I only talked about this one terrible thing in the book and not these more common, less terrible outcomes? Interesting, and also for people who might be here to learn tonight as well, Garrett. And Susan, I mean, say your child, what, what's the difference between like a kid of yours smoking a bit of cannabis, which is, I know it's never, but isn't a massive problem, and then when it actually becomes a serious problem? I mean, is, is there a tipping point? And can you, can you get better if you have overused cannabis? Like, can you improve? Well, I think I'd be more worried, to be honest with you, my kids smoking tobacco, because the tobacco is probably going to kill them, and the cannabis won't. <laughs> Um, that's the reality of it. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that the vast majority of people who will smoke Brad, cannabis okay. will will <laughs> will drop. He's gone. The vast majority. Of wait, wait, go on. He switched my microphone off. No, no. <laughs> go on, Gareth. The vast majority of people who smoke cannabis will do it as a rite of passage, and most of them will not come to any harm. But sadly, a lot of these people will be addicted to tobacco, and I think this is a very important message because Susan mentioned about eighteen percent. We, we, we shouldn't get too carried away with how successful that message has been and the, um, the, the legislation. The one thing we didn't do with tobacco, uh, I just wouldn't mention, we didn't ban it, that's for sure. We, we regulated it, and it was absolutely the right thing to do in terms of smoking in public places. But we haven't got that message, and I think we're, we're, we're going to take our eye off the ball both with uh, tobacco, and we've certainly in this country, um, and I think Alex will know this, this we, we have a real problem with alcohol in this country. Um, and we may, we may end up taking our eye off the ball on that because we're, we're, we're putting a lot of effort into this lately, but we, we, we haven't got the alcohol message right at all. Susan, come on, but just yeah. before I let Alex work in, Susan. I think it's really important to try and keep everything in context. It's a very, it seems to be a very polarised debate. There, there is very much about, there's, there are people who use cannabis very infrequently. Most of them do not become dependent on it. But about 17% of people who use cannabis at some point during their use will meet criteria for dependency. So most of them, fortunately, are able to be pulled back with supports that, that are around them. And then a small number will go on to have serious cannabis use disorder that has a major impact on their life in terms of their work, their social functioning, and their success. And I have to say, if I had a, a child who was using cannabis daily, I would be really freaked out about that for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. You know. Maybe for a week or two, everyone might go through phases or whatever, but to be persistently using cannabis, um, I, I think, would be very concerning. Because of actually the more minor, you know, what we think of as minor, psychosis is rare, but it's the other demotivating things. 
And I suppose the other thing I'd, I'd like to say is why are people doing it? You know, we, we have a society where there's huge inequalities. People don't have the same opportunities. We don't have the same services for teenagers living in poorer areas. And there is li very limited access to psychological supports and psychiatric supports for teenagers in poorer parts of the country. And so they may well turn to substances. Um, and that's a, a wider issue. Before I go to the audience, do you want to reply oh, to Gareth? Well, I would, I would just say, I, I don't think, uh, I, I would take uh, lung cancer at age 60 over psychosis at age 22 any day. Um, uh, not that I'd like to have either one. <laughs> I guess I'm too old to have. <laughs> it's like, um, uh, I mean, I, I think it is very interesting with tobacco. We didn't ban tobacco, okay? And, and tobacco is still widely sold in the U.S., and it's, and it's relatively cheap uh, in a lot of places. And yet use among youth is much lower than cannabis use. But forgetting the nicotine vaping issue, which has, you know, sort of suddenly exploded, we have done that with societal discouragement, with, and mainly, mainly with negative reinforcement. Um, you know, not, you know, mainly by convincing people that it is not cool to smoke. And, and it's very interesting that you know, the legal status of the drug had nothing to do with that. It wasn't outlawing it. It was discouraging people from using it. Um, uh, I, you know, I think the, the question of how many people will become a quote unquote addicted to cannabis is a very interesting one. It, it seems with the high, prep, the high potency product that's in use in the US, um, there are some people out there who think that even that 17% number might be a little bit low. I mean, it, it seems clear that there, it's, cannabis is a very interesting drug. There are some people who just don't like the effect it has on them, even if they use it once. I mean, most people who drink will, will, you know, they'll drink a few times and see if they like it or don't. There's clearly a number of people out there who, who use cannabis once and find it makes them paranoid and just don't ever use it again. And so if you factor those people out and you look at people who seem to not have a negative experience with the drug the first time they used it, and you look at the higher potency preparations, um, you get to numbers that are more than 20% of people who use it will become dependent on it. And, and dependence is a funny thing. And uh, you know, in some ways, I'm over my skis in talking about this because I'm not an MD. I'm not a, 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 you know, a specialist in, a, in addiction. But to me, there's lots of different ways to define dependence and addiction. But the simplest one, to me, seems like the best one, which is, are you continuing to use this drug even though it's causing problems for you? So you know, we're all addicted to coffee. Okay, we all get headaches if we don't drink coffee, but drinking coffee for the most part doesn't cause problems for anybody. With, with other drugs, including alcohol, you know, if, if you're continuing to use, even though it's causing problems in your life, in your job, in your relationships, I'd say you have a, you have a problem. You are addicted to this in some way. And, and, and a large number of people who use cannabis will fall into that. One, one last really fascinating number. In the United States, um, uh, and, and the U.S. and Canada are the places that have the most cannabis use of anywhere in the world on a percentage basis, maybe Israel, but the U.S. and Canada. And so even in those countries, cannabis use is relatively marginal. Only about 15% uh, of people over the age of 18 used cannabis even once last year in the United States in, 19, in, in 2018. Okay, so that's about 40 million people in the U.S. Um, about 170 million American adults used alcohol. Alcohol is much more common. But if you look at the number of people who use daily, and I think daily use, still use doesn't prove you have a problem, but it's, it's a good marker for potentially having a problem. Almost as many people used cannabis daily as used alcohol, according to the, to the national survey. About 12 million people used alcohol daily. Almost 9 million people use cannabis daily. So almost one in five people who use cannabis in the US are daily using. And that's much less true for alcohol, only about one in 15. And so for whatever reason, once people start to use this drug and decide they like it, they use it a lot. I suspect that's because it's not as physically damaging as alcohol. You can sort of use it all day, every day, and convince yourself that everything's fine, even though all of a sudden you got fired and you're, you, know, you don't have a relationship anymore. It's, it, it, you know, I mean, really, these things happen. For, okay. But uh, so, so anyway, my, I have to bring I, in my I'm audience. being shushed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cut you off there, Minister. Okay, who would like to throw a question to the panel? Uh, Mr. Kelly, there. Uh, yeah. Um, just my daughter has a. Uh, Will we get you a microphone? Will we? Can we bring a mic down here to the floor? Is that okay? Who's got a microphone? Um, I have a microphone here. Do you want to go with my question first? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Hello. Wow. This man is first. <laughs> but good try. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Brian Kelly, and uh, I have a five-year-old daughter with Gervais syndrome. Uh, she's on the kind of milder version of Gervais syndrome. We started using a uh, hemp product uh, two years ago, uh, Charlotte's Web, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. But we used that for 12 months. Uh, before that, we would have been in ICU three, to four, three or four times where she had been intubated to stop her seizures. Uh, she averaged out about one seizure a month. Um, we started using uh, a, a Dutch product with the support of our consultant in Temple Street uh, about a year ago. Uh, Lucia was non-verbal this time last year, where she had two or three word sentences, very limited vocabulary. Uh, Lucia started mainstream school in September with a little help with the cannabis. We believe it stopped. Now, she still has her monthly large seizure, which, which happens, and it can be from five minutes to half an hour and they're scary, but they've kind of gone to focal seizures, so they're not as, as severe. Uh, basically, my question would be is that there's a lot of confusion about the campaign. Like, we were one of the first families to get the support of a consultant within the HSC, and we're one of, the fir we're one of only four families who've got uh, reimbursement. Uh, it took us eight months to get reimbursement, uh, and we had great support from our, our consultant in uh, Temple Street. Uh, he was unbelievable helpful so he was but the HSE delayed us in every way possible they could to give us the reimbursement we were lucky enough to be able to afford, the re afford to buy this product it costs up on 12,000 euro last year uh, we are one of the few families who could probably afford to, to pay, it, pay for that uh, I have an email from a company in, in Canada Tilray I'm sure you're for, who produce very good medical product and they are saying that the, it's the Irish government that are delaying the, the, the import of medical grade product into the country. So, and, and your question, well that's wonderful that it's actually been so helpful for your daughter. Is that your question well, Brian? The, 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 the yeah. question is that I think the consultants like yourself need to marry up more with the families. I've kind of got a group okay. of parents together and because what the government are doing and what they're saying to some of the consultants, I think, there are two different levels. And I'm just, I'm just okay. wondering... Norman, I think, might be good at Brian, taking that for Brian. Yeah, yeah thanks, Brian. Brian, thanks for that. I mean, look, look we, the, me, the medical, the, the epileptology neurology community uh, want pharmaceutical grade CBD available today, tomorrow, so we can prescribe appropriately for patients like, for example, for Drave syndrome. I'm not here, obviously, I'm not here on behalf of the minister, clearly. No. Yeah, it is extremely frustrating that this is dragging on and on. But it, one of the issues, I suppose, in, in, in fairness to the Department of Health, it, the European Medicines Agency has not still yet formally approved uh, Epidiolux uh, CBD uh, for Drave syndrome or lennox gastro syndrome. But I'm, we're, 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 we're we want to be able to prescribe this drug for appropriate, appropriate patients, like like your child with Dravet syndrome, absolutely. Mm. It is extremely frustrating for everybody. We, me and my colleagues are we we've been we've been in with the minister, we've been in with the HSC, we've had multiple emails again this week. It's dragging on and on. It's a, it's extremely frustrating for, yeah. for, for 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 the doctors and clearly for the families. Absolutely. But it, but it all comes back to like if you're from a lower socio-economic background, like you were saying, you can't afford to get help. We could afford to get help. That's why our child is in mainstream school now, albeit with a little help. But very rare for a Dervais child to go to mainstream school because yeah. of the severity of the seizures. No, I mean, it should be available for Dravet, absolutely. Do, do you have any sense of why the EMA is not? Yeah. What I've heard in the grapevine about why the European Medicines Agency are delaying on this, despite the fact that the FDA have approved Epidiolux um, in, in the United States, um, is that it, it, in, in one of the main clinical trial that was published in the New England Journal, I think 60% of the, of the children were, on, were also being uh, treated with a drug called Clobazam. And uh, Epidiolux CBD reduces the metabolism of Clobazam, so the Clobazam levels went up significantly. And Clobazam is, is also, as you know, Frisium is an anti-epileptic drug. So I think that's one of the issues they're examining. I mean, none of us are hoping that the EMA are going to come out and say that we need to do another trial in, in Dravet syndrome. 
Uh, but I, that's what I heard in the grapevine. I can't stand over it. That's exactly the reason why they're delaying on it. But you know, I speak to GW Pharma, and they say oh, we're, we're expecting news quarter one. We're expecting news quarter two. Is one of these things that keeps going down the road. It's worse than the B word, you know. So uh, it, it's a, it, it is very frustrating. Okay, but look, thanks for that contribution, Brian, and uh, maybe follow it up in the media. That could be useful, you know. The ministers don't like it. Um, <laughs> where's the man who's here who wants to ask a question? Set great. There you go. Thank you. Thank you to the panel as well. It's really interesting. Um, we, you were talking about alcohol on the one hand, and you're talking about cannabis on the other hand, but as if there were two separate things. But, I mean, if one is in daily use of cannabis, and then one overlays that with daily use of alcohol, and then one overlays that with binge drinking every now and again, what's going to happen? I mean, how does, it, does that... Good does that, do, You're does not that, going to be very happy. No, but, but <laughs> well, no, but uh, you know, just looking at kids today, yeah. you know, I, you know, I see kids and, and they're smoking daily cannabis, and then they're going off drinking. Uh, you know, yeah, so I, yeah, yeah I, I, will, for that good I will say that you know, one of the promises, one of the many on Kevin's promises mm -hmm. of legalization in the U.S. was that cannabis, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that it's safer than alcohol. It's 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 physically safer. It's not psychiatrically safer. But let's say it's safer. So the the idea was you legalize cannabis, you will displace alcohol use. People who are choosing to get drunk will instead get high. Um, that does not appear to be the case. Again, if you look at the national numbers uh, in the U.S., the number of daily cannabis users has tripled to that nine million number in the last fifteen years. But the number of daily alcohol users has also gone up. So it seems that either we're creating uh, you know, a group of poly drug users, mm. or these people who were not using alcohol just decided to start using cannabis. One of those two things is happening. It's clear from the numbers. Um, and, and the other thing that's happening, unfortunately, in the US is it's clear that people will drive um, having used both. They'll, they'll certainly drive having used cannabis once it's legalized. And, and road traffic accidents and deaths in the states that have legalized traffic deaths um, are significantly up since 2013. So, so, so certainly on the roads, a little bit of alcohol and a little bit of cannabis is a dangerous combination. And that's a message that is not getting out there. Mary, you want to come in? Um, yeah, just, just two things. Um, one is, is uh, somewhat surprising to me, though, is the studies are beginning to come out now showing that actually cannabis, he heavy cannabis use in adolescents has, uh, in young people has a worse effect on your outcomes, your educational outcomes, your financial outcomes, your, your than, uh, than alcohol use. And this, and this is something we need to think about. But I suppose the other issue is that, that I, my impression, and I'm not an addiction adolescent psychiatrist, is that, that, that cannabis users um, don't, if they're heavy cannabis users, they don't tend to use alcohol as well. And maybe some of them be... I would entirely disagree. Yeah. I, I would entirely yeah. disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, alcohol is in some way psychologically less damaging than cannabis. That's not that's not what I'm seeing in my cl clinical practice. Alcohol is devastating on the brain, certainly in higher concentrations. And the sad thing about this country is probably 60% of people who drink probably do it too much. A lot of it is a hidden population because we don't see these patients coming um, coming for treatment. I mean, hardly anybody who has an addiction in this country actually gets treatment. So they're a hidden population. Um, and I think we need to you know, comparing these drugs, we, we do it when it suits us and we kind of, when it doesn't suit us, we don't do it. But uh, to say cannabis is psychologically more damaging than alcohol, I don't think the, 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 the evidence is there to, uh, to it is, support actually, that. It's, I, I, I would disagree, Mary. I, I think no, alcohol can, is devastating on the brain. Alcohol and tobacco are more, are more damaging to the body. Cannabis is disagree. more damaging to I, the brain. Well, I, okay, we'll agree well, to I, I I probably, I'm going to go to this man in the front of you. Hi. Um, Thanks very much for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, my name is Jerry. I am an adolescent addiction psychiatrist. Um, I work along with Bobby Smith as the, the two adolescent addiction psychiatrists in the country. Um, I cover North Dublin City and County. Um, today I saw eight young people before coming here. Um, two of them were suicidal actively. Wow. Um, one of oh, them. Nice. Um, one was 17, one was uh, 16. Uh, another another young man. He, um, he he was finding great difficulty from the point of view of anxiety disorder, um, dealing a lot, trying to manage his cravings. He was trying really hard to give up cannabis. Um, I think it's, it's it's very important to point out that cannabis has a significant withdrawal syndrome for for many young people who have been using daily. And I would think that many of our young people use daily um, or most days. And um, you know 
these daily, many of them from a very early point in their drug use history. Um, trying to stop is significantly more difficult than people had realised. So it's uh, just significant withdrawal symptoms in the first week, somewhat in the second week. The craving goes for a longer period of time. Um, there's a significant mood shift. Um, we have significant degrees of anxiety disorder, significant low moods, high rates of self-harm. Um, and many of these are associated with cannabis only. Many of our young people, uh, in, in the practice I see, we have, I'd say, uh, it's, it's over 90% of young people who present who use cannabis on a regular basis. Over 50% of them would use it daily. Many of them would begin probably from the age of 13, 14. Um, one young man today I saw, he was suspended from school for dealing. Uh, he's 14. And so these are, these are the issues you're dealing with. Granted, we're seeing the, the harder end. Um, we're not seeing lots of people with psychosis, but we do, we do see some. And we certainly see them after being discharged from, from the inpatient units. Um, one of the, the great unseen and unspoken of difficulties is this drop off of young people from the trajectory that they would have had in life, where you know they would previously have been um, enthusiastic about their future, engaged in, in, in you know in the sport and pro-social activities, um, you know involved in the family and, and trying hard in school, uh, it falls off a cliff. Um, their interest in, 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 in school and their career aspirations and nosedive for many of them. And um, the more they use, the more regular they use, the earlier they start, you can see that the bigger the impact. Um, people drop out of school, family relations fall apart sometimes, huge drug debts sometimes. Um, that young man who was 14 this morning, um, drug debt of over 300 euros. And, um, you know, so these, these are significant issues. And we see, we, see, we see a lot of that. We're seeing a spike at the moment in, in cocaine use with young people. Um, and polydrug use and alcohol use on top of the, the cannabis use is, is, is par for the course. However, cannabis use is by far the biggest problem um, that we're seeing. And the cannabis, the cannabis rates and the, the strength of the cannabis that they're using is significant. And these young people are pawns in, in the gang turf wars. Um, they're, 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 they're delivery boys. Um, they get you know lots of uh, goodies, both drugs-wise and cash, um, to to deliver things, and they consider this is far more, uh, I suppose, engaging for them and far more um, what they're looking for than them staying in school or listening to their parents. And so the whole psychosocial aspect is a massive problem associated. So. Uh, I can understand the philosophical arguments in relation to cannabis, and I can understand the, the pro and, and, and anti, uh, I suppose, arguments in relation to legalization or decriminalization. Um, but I think I, I still have to meet somebody who can stand in front of me and say, when you're using cannabis, you perform better, and to be able to prove that. Because you don't. It affects your concentration, your coordination. It's like being drunk, you know, and nobody is better, you know, performance-wise when they're drunk. They're not better when they're smoking cannabis. Um, and I think it's important to realise that. Thanks so much for that conversation. There's a woman here, yeah? Have you got a microphone? Or the man? Oh, no, sorry. Well, sorry. You have the mic. Um, Don't fight. Thanks very much for a fantastic presentation. I just want to ask um, that you didn't highlight the carcinogenic risks in relation to regular cannabis use, which obviously is extremely bad. It's causing a huge amount of problems today. Thanks for that, Alex. Uh, um, like, well, so... Uh, like if you're smoking a cigarette, you inhale a cigarette, but when you're smoking cannabis, you inhale it much deeper to get the effect, you know? For, so for, whatever, for whatever reason, the epidemiology does not seem to be there on that, in part because at least... In Europe, a lot of cannabis is smoked with tobacco, so it's pretty hard to tease out those effects. Um, and there's some other evidence, for example, that cannabis seems to be uh, related to higher risk of testicular cancer. Um, but but the, the cancer evidence is not as strong, uh, surprisingly, as you might think. Um, and, uh, you know, although... Although I get accused of, you know, sort of making things up, I actually try to stick very, very closely to what the science says, and so that's why I, I haven't really talked about that. Um, but, but it's certainly an issue worth discussing. The lady there, yeah. Oh, there was a woman up here with a microphone, isn't there? Yeah, off you go. Thank, you. thanks very much, Miriam. Um, I would represent a parent of a child 
who developed schizophrenia um, as a result of a few weeks consumption of cannabis when they were 18. He is now 30 years old. Mr. Gareth McGovern, you are so wrong. I had a school-going, healthy son partaking in school teams in a nice part of Dublin, so it wasn't, as this person has said, um, where they were struggling for money or anything else. It probably had access to too much money. He had a twin. His twin is now a qualified solicitor. He has a brother two years younger who's a fund manager. Very successful. Sean cannot work. Sean cannot read because of the effects the drugs have as side effects to stabilize him with his schizophrenia. He has it for life. I have a beautiful, dependent, 30-year-old son for his lifetime who has bloods taken every four weeks so that the effects of the drugs on his system while they help to maintain his schizophrenia and his paranoia and his hearing of voices. The drugs also have detrimental side effects, as in enormous weight gain, as in uh, white blood cells, the possibility of those lowering and Sean developing another very serious illness as a result of that. So he needs constant monitoring and it's done, and I'm lucky to say I live in Dublin, and I live near the place that monitors Sean. I'm very lucky. If I were down the country, I don't know what would happen. But, Dr. McGovern, you're completely wrong in relation to the effects of alcohol versus the effects of cannabis. And I'm astonished that you would even think that, because all of my children... Uh, it happened while they were abroad. We have strange laws around Europe and around the US, and uh, Dr. Burnson might agree with this. It simply happened, and I'll finish shortly now, but it just simply happened over a summer where my children could go to Portugal and they could drink legally at the age of 16. They could go here in Ireland, they could drink legally at 18, and in the States they could drink legally at 21. And they happened to spend a holiday in Portugal and in the States that summer. And it was in Portugal that the cannabis was taken. I'm not saying anything bad about Portugal. I'm just saying laws vary in different countries in relation to legal consumption of these things. That's it. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. For coming. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's very honest. I'm so sorry about your son, Sean. Gareth, do you just want to come in? Yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your son, Sean, mm -hmm. and, and I mean that. And I'm not uh, blind to the ill effects of cannabis. I, I, I'm coming from an addiction treatment st uh, standpoint, and I treat people who become uh, paranoid and psychotic who take too much cannabis. So I'm, I'm, I'm not dismissive of it. I, what I was trying to say about alcohol is that I have seen also people who have become very mentally ill, who have daily drank large quantities of alcohol. So I, I don't think we, I wasn't dismissive of the psychological effects of heavy cannabis use. I was just merely making the point that I don't think it's one versus the other, but I think uh, we, we shouldn't be uh, blind to the effects alcohol has in the brain. And alcohol, after all, you know, I have patients, adult patients who have dementia as a result of uh, drinking heavy amounts of alcohol. I would say one thing that your, your son, in the current environment in Ireland has been criminalised um, if he is caught in possession of taking those drugs. And that's something I feel very strongly about. I think people who become unwell, like your son, shouldn't be criminalised. Uh, they should be given the help that they need. All right. Would someone else like to ask a question? We're coming to... Yeah, I think Gareth misunderstood that. Yeah, no, I think... He, he was just going to yeah. be some Yeah, Mary, you uh, want to I come just in? Say, um, I, I, I'd just like to congratulate you for speaking out because we hear very little yeah. from parents of young people with psychosis. So thank you, thank you for that. It's yeah. very brave. Very brave. I might change.
I want to take a few more. Yeah, whoever uh, has the microphone. Hi, hi. Th I just wanted to say thanks to the panel. It's been a really interesting discussion. But uh, my question is to do with recreational use and what we can do as a society to try and decrease the negative effects of recreational use in Ireland. Obviously, there's a fraction of the population that do use it recreationally. And as you were saying, uh, Professor Mary uh, Cannon, that, uh, that has led to an increase in uh, cannabis-induced psychosis. Uh, wouldn't regulation help to decrease the amount of THC that is in cannabis and to prevent that from maybe having an effect on the public who are using it uh, recreationally? And if, if so, what could the medical or scientific community do to communicate that to the public? I, I think... Um I think uh, it, that's a very interesting point, but I, I think Alex might be better to answer that. You, you've well, seen well, what's I, happened well, when you legalise recreational cannabis potency. Yeah, so use. unfortunately, <laughs> another, uh, another myth of legalisation is that legalisation will somehow reduce the potency of cannabis products, um, that, that it's dealers who drive potency. The idea is that uh, you want to be able to, to smuggle less, uh, and so you give people a higher potency product. Um, and that really comes out of alcohol prohibition in the United States. I mean, alcohol is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty big substance, right? So if you're going to, a beer, a keg of beer is a big, heavy thing. And if you can give people a, a liter of spirits instead, you'll do that. But it turns out that's actually not really true for any other drug. Most other drugs are, you know, sort of dosed by the gram or the milligram, or in some cases, the microgram. And, and uh, you know, that's pretty easy to smuggle under any circumstance. So it turns out that what actually drives uh, higher potency, at least in cannabis, is user de desire to get high more quickly and more easily. And so in the US, um, there's been a very uh, marked increase in potency uh, in the last 20 years uh, with legalization, as legalization has happened, where uh, you know, in, the, in the 90s, the average uh, herbal cannabis might be 5 or 6% THC. Uh, now it's 20 or 25 percent THC, and again, many people are prefer to use these sort of semi-synthetic products that are almost pure THC. So, and, and the market will respond to that. If that's what people go into the stores wanting, then that's what that's what the dispensaries will have. Um, and this appears to be an unfixable problem. Uh, in the U.S., there's there's sort of been a couple ways that states have legalized. Some states like California have gone with very high regulations high taxes, those states have a very big black or illicit market in cannabis um, because, uh, because the product is widely available um, through illicit dispensaries and from delivery services. The other thing you can do is have a low uh, regulation market as states like Oregon have done where you essentially allow almost anybody to start farming and to open a dispensary. In those states, you do have more of a displacement of the illicit market you also have incredibly low-priced cannabis. So an ounce of relatively potent cannabis in Oregon can be had for as low as $35 or $40. And so th that's really, um, that's the equivalent of a, of a gallon of vodka for a couple of dollars in terms of the units of, uh, of intoxicant that you get. And so that definitely leads to more use, especially use by teenagers who are pretty price sensitive. Um, and so, I mean, this, this seems to be an unfixable problem from a regulatory point of view. You just don't, there's just no good answer. You can either have a big illicit, I, I see that Sheila's got her hand. Um, we, we have either a big illicit market and a regulated market, or we have a really low priced regulated market. And that's why I again say that the answer is regulation. I'm sorry, the answer is, is sort of societal discouragement more than any regulatory scheme, because you just can't fix this. Okay, question. Uh, yeah. This is actually a fixable problem. And I was at a conference in uh, Vancouver last year on uh, uh, the statistics around cannabis. And as you probably know, Will you hold the mic up, Joy, just there, yeah. there are There are no real good statistics on cannabis because it has been an illegal substance for a long time. So there hasn't been a lot of uh, research done. There was a, a scientist there from NIDA who, who uh, was talking about the statistical differences between the Canadian experience in, in decriminalizing and controlling cannabis and the US uh, experience. And the difference is that in the US, as with the opiates, this is a, 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 a business-driven uh, uh, enterprise. And the, in the States, they're allowed to, to, um, to advertise. And of course, the people they target are the people who want the high THC uh, cannabis. 
So the, the industry themselves in the US are promoting high potency cannabis. In Canada, most of the cannabis that's being sold through the government outlets is highly controlled. It's high CBD, high THC. You can buy high THC as well if you want it. But most of it is a, a very soft sort of a mixture of, of, uh, of cannabis, highly, highly controlled. And this is the first occasion, actually, that we will have a chance to do proper research on cannabis. So, so because we know now, we know what people are taking, and we know okay. how often they're taking it, and we can examine that, uh, the, the outcomes. And we won't know for five or ten years, possibly. So, okay. so I would sharply disagree with almost everything you said and say it's factually inaccurate. Um, in Canada right now, uh, vapes and oils are not legal. They will be legalized, I think, in October. Um, and in Canada, the illicit market has remained huge because th those are the products that a lot of young Canadians want. Um, and that's why they're essentially being forced into legalizing everything because uh, the regulated market can't really compete. It's the same as it's the same in California. I'd also disagree that we haven't done research on cannabis or its positive and negative effects. It's actually very funny to me that 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 50, 50 years ago, actually, when there was the first major fight over scheduling in the U.S., um, there was a quote from a, a, a guy named Lester Grinspoon, who's a one of the fathers of, uh, of sort of legalized uh, cannabis in the United States, saying, I can't wait because we're really going to be able to start researching this properly. That was in 1972. There's been a tremendous amount of research in the UK, in Europe, in Israel, and in the US. And the reason that we don't find a lot of medical benefits for THC is because there aren't a lot of medical benefits for THC. Mary, and then I'm going to go. Yeah, just, just on that point, I mean, uh, Professor Robin Murray, who's, who's one of the experts, you, you, you've read, mentioned him in your book, Alex, he said that essentially the US and Canada are playing a giant pharmaceutical experiment with the brains of their young people. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ray Wally, I'm a GP in North Dublin. Um, and I've got primary and secondary school in North Eater City, and I've been a GP for 21 years in North Eater, so I've got a lot of experience of people with cannabis. Uh, all of the addiction patients that I've got say that their gateway was cannabis. All their family say their gateway was cannabis. And one of the arguments of the uh, individuals who want to legalize it is that in deprivation areas, you'll end up having less access uh, are less problems with Canada. What is the experience of Canada and America in regard to that argument? Um, so, so I think the, I think the gateway. I mean, as as you say, I think it's an interesting issue, right? If if the idea, and this is what the Dutch decided in the seventies, right? We're going to separate cannabis from these other drugs, and so we're hopefully have less of a gateway, you know, culturally and through people going to dealers. Um, I'm not an expert on what's happened in in the Netherlands. Um, I can tell you, again, as far as the U.S. goes, I'm not, I'm not so much in Canada, but there, it's quite clear for many people who wound up using opioids that cannabis was their first drug. Now, again, I know there's an argument that cannabis was just the first drug because it was more available and they would have wound up using opioids whether or not <coughs> cannabis had existed, but I think you can't ignore the timeline. Um, and there's, there, there doesn't seem to be any evidence at this point in the states that have legalized that there's less opioid use. So again, that, that was an argument that was made based on a 2014 paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which has since been found to be uh, effectively wrong if you look at more recent data. So, so, so at the least, it's very hard to say that cannabis legalization somehow has reduced opioid use. There just doesn't seem to be good evidence for that in the US. OK, now I'm wrong, Mato, the part, yeah. Um, this is just in yeah. relation to a comment that Dr. McGovern made. Um, you said that Poor you girls. would be. <laughs> you said that you would be much more worried about your child smoking uh, cigarettes than smoking cannabis. Yeah. And from personal experience, having a family member who's passed away from one use of synthetic cannabis, I think that's a horrible thing to say. To stand there as a healthcare professional and say that when people have died from one use, it's just so beyond reality. And I just really think you need to think about that. Okay, thank you for that. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, okay, about your family member. Do you want to say anything here? No, I mean, I, 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 I'm sorry to hear, hear your family members passed away. It's awful for anybody. I mean, I, I would say that I've seen an awful lot of people in my own family pass away due to tobacco use. 
Um, and yeah, but but I think tobacco use is going to kill far more people than cannabis. I'm, I'm, that that I don't think anybody would dispute that. Um, and I would be worried about my my uh, son or my daughter using tobacco. Uh, I take it very very seriously, um, and it is likely to be the drug that they will find the hardest to get off. Well, look, thank you for that, and thank you very much for talking to us about your family member and also that lady there about her son, Sean. Listen, we've run out of time as ever. I've run miles over. I want to thank Alex Berenson, Norman Delante, Mary Cannon, Garrett McGovern and Susan Smith. Thank you. for coming out. I thought it was a really interesting debate and it's a great idea, these My Health RCSI lectures. And there's lots more coming up.